Brian Scalabrini joins right now. Sir, I don't even know where you want to start on this particular game. I don't even know what camera's mine. Um, because there's so much to do. The turnovers, the Tatum shot, do you foul, do you not foul? What was the one big thing that stood out the most for you in last night's steal of a victory? It, it's amazing, and I'm and I'm a Celtic analyst, and I'm supposed to, you know, sort of be have green uh, lenses on, but the inconsistency of the Boston Celtics is so alarming. The fact that they came out and they were pushing the pace and you're thinking, all right, I love the game plan. You know, pace a game against a team that loves to run and they go up 12-0 and then slowly but surely start walking the ball up. You know, the defensive intensity wasn't there. I will give them credit from this standpoint. They don't foul the Indiana Pacers. Uh, you guys mentioned the free throws before we went to break. Only three in regulation. The other seven, that would happen in overtime. So I give them credit from that standpoint. But, man, they I think they really dodged a bullet in that game. And if Indiana just did some minor things, like call a timeout to advance the ball, defend the three, you know, step to the ball when you're trying to catch it, the Celtics would be down 0-1 right now. No reason to panic from them, but it's still a little bit strange that they're not a consistent team at this point with all this talent. Yeah, Brian, it does feel like they got a little bit away with murder here. I thought they'd be down 1-0. <laughs> In that situation, that corner three, me and Lou always debate this. I'm a big foul up three guy, especially if you're the yeah. shooter, the guy catches the ball, gives you time to do that, which he did. He didn't put the ball on the floor, so it was a little dicey. If you're Rick Carlisle, are you obviously watching it back now? He made an incredible shot. Are you fouling up three? Yeah, I think so. But more more than that, Chandler, how about um, how about not guarding the two, right? Like, <laughs> right. let's say me and you are coming together defensively, and and I'm talking a hundred times out of a hundred, if we want to put our back to the outside, right, to the sideline, to half court, allow you to cut to the basket, take the Jalen Brown layup, all you <clears> want, <throat> but. How are you even getting screened in that moment right. when all you have to do is protect against the three? So we could do the foul game if you want. So there was about eight seconds to go uh, during that time. But I don't understand how, if you look at all the Indiana Pacers, like in that possession, you just don't play it standard. You don't have your back to the basket or to the, uh, the guy taking the ball on the baseline. You just play on the outside. Just and when they come to you, you absorb that. So there's so many things that were wrong. And plus, if you can see the ball, when the ball is in the air, at that point, you can grab. Obviously, you can't do it beforehand. But why at any point, if you don't have to protect against the two, would you not uh, keep your eye on the ball and take that foul when the ball's in the air? Yeah. Yeah, Scal, I'm just, I'm, I'm not a fan of donating points whatsoever. You know, I know the foul when you're up three, that's a, that's a relatively new thing that uh, coaches and, and teams have started to go, go with. I'm old school. Why well, put pressure on myself? If I'm going to give you two free throws, now I got it. I'm putting pressure on myself to get the ball in. I'm putting pressure on myself to deal with traps. I'm putting pressure on myself to also make free throws. And then I still got to come down and get another stop, which you still have an opportunity. I just hate the whole foul game thing when you can just buckle down and try to get a stop. And like you said, guard the three-point line. You know, those are yeah. playground rules. When you're on a playground, hey, hey, no twos, no twos. And you'll literally sure. stand behind a guy and make him and force him to the rim. <clears throat> they had... Uh, how many opportunities to win this basketball game? So I don't think yeah. the fouls probably would have saved them, but it, it, they had too many scenarios, too many different ways to lose the basketball game, and they, that was the one that they picked last night. Yeah, and, and you, you know, do you point to inexperience? I know Siakam's won a championship. This guy's been in the battles. Like, they beat the Golden State Warriors. I know yeah. KD got hurt and everything like that, but, like, Siakam has been in big games. Do we really have to say step no, over the like lane, go to the ball? Like, yeah, I'm that not, that it doesn't look like experience. Yeah. That they're making, like the Indiana Pacers, it's almost as if you're saying, well, man, they got a deep team. They do this. They pace the game. I, I like the way they play. They play hard. But, like, maybe gee, they just weren't ready to, to beat, you know, to go to the NBA Finals. And it, it was really amazing just the last 30 seconds of that game. I, I genuinely think that they thought the game was over. Then they came we all the did. Point <laughs> that <laughs> we thought it was but Carlisle's got championship experience. Yeah, so it's like yeah. that. I can't even fathom that as the excuse. It was, a, it was an insane turnaround in a short period of time. Um, you've called it seek and destroy mode. There, there's a it's like a lack of intensity. I, I sort of look at it as if sometimes I watch the Celtics team and it, they feel like they're a team that's already won a couple championships but they have it. But there's that vibe. What What is that? Is it the players? Is it coaching? How does that even happen? I don't know. I, I'm being honest with you, Michelle. I don't know. Like, okay, I'll give you an example. 
You guys remember when Drew Holiday got into Halliburton's airspace and he forced that turnover, right? So this is the Eastern Conference Finals. I don't need to see that 100 times a game. But I, I would think any time, and I, you know, you've been around great teams. Like, I was on a great team in 08. Like, any time things start to go sideways, you just pick up your defensive intensity. That's what you do, right? And I'm surprised. Why does the Celtics have to seem like improbable odds to win a game for them to raise up their level? It just doesn't feel right. Like, in the NBA, people think it's, like, just the last possession. But there are moments, and you could, like, I can go to a, all kinds of great players. Michelle, you love the San Antonio Spurs. Yeah. So Tim Duncan will get you 14 points, but every time you're on like a 6-0 run or an 8-2 run and Popovich is doing this, that ball's going to Tim Duncan and he goes and gets you a big, uh, big bucket. So I just wonder, there's a lot of times where teams are on runs against this Boston Celtic team. Think about it. They're up 12 in the first quarter. They're up 13 in the third quarter. And they don't really respond when a team sort of makes a run. And that's what, historically, when you see great teams, that's what we're used to. We're used to the great player going to a different level and saying, all right, enough is enough, little brother. We're, <laughs> let me just take this game over. Bop, bop, bop. Now it's 14 again. And I just, I, I cover this team all year long. And they find ways to win. I'm, I'm not, you can't take anything away from 64 wins and where they're at in the Eastern Conference Finals. But... There are moments where you're wondering, are you guys going to, at this point, establish your dominance? Let the other team know that there are levels to this game and you are not on my level. And I'm not seeing enough of that from this Celtic team so far. But, you know, maybe it's because it's the Indiana Pacers. Maybe if they played Minnesota or they played Dallas, it will be different. But at this point, I'm waiting for those moments and I'm not finding them. That's what's kind of confusing to me when I hear some people call this Celtics team a super team. And I'm like, ah, this isn't a super, this isn't, they didn't join up like the big three. This isn't KD going to the Warriors. So what, what's your thoughts on when you hear this team that hasn't won a championship be called a super team? I mean, on paper, with accolades, you, want, you can call them a super team if you want. You know, like what Porzingis was at times. You think about Holiday, underrated, Derek White. Another guy that wasn't even ESPN's top 100. We all know, like, Derek White's a borderline all-star. Al Horford, generational winner. So, yeah, like, on paper, but they don't play like a super team. And, I'll, yeah, I'll go back to my example. Man, you can play the Warriors shot for shot. You can go punch for punch. But there's a 16-2 there's a run coming that you just can't do anything about. And we're just not seeing enough of that from this team consistently. So I hope, I hope they turn it around. I hope that they start playing better. And it's hard not to look at the Minnesota Timberwolves and the way that they bring it defensively and not say, well, if what we're watching right now from them, and I get it, they're going against the defending champs, Denver Nuggets, a lot of motivation there. You know, the whole like, Tim Conley thing and everything that team has built to beat that team. There's a historic rival rivalry in the last couple of years with Minnesota and Denver. I understand all that, but I'm saying I'm watching that team play and I'm wondering, can my Celtic team for 48 minutes get to that same level? I would be surprised if they do. I think they can. I've seen some battles with some really good teams, and they go shot for shot, and it looks good. I mean, you know, maybe they were bored against Miami because they were hurt, and they were bored against Cleveland because no Donovan Mitchell, and they looked a little bored against Indiana last night. Scott, you think that's more of a, a personality thing? Because, you know, when you look at Minnesota, Ant, Ant Man, he's fiery. He's, he's teaching Cat how to be fiery. Jason Tatum and, and Brown, they, they some laid back cats. Do you think that's a, a personality <laughs> thing? I've been begging, Lou, <laughs> I've been begging those guys on air to be like, this is what the playoffs are all about. I'm all cool with the sacrifices of getting your teammates involved. I'm good with that. Like, I, I you know what? I'm going to tip my hat to you in the regular season saying, you know, let, let D. White go off, let Drew Holiday, let, let Porzingis have his shine. But when the playoffs come around, like, I don't know any other way from these star players that I have been around or I have seen, and you can go down the list. Star players, star players are savages. They're killers. They do it uh, every, every moment, and they're looking to destroy, and their stats go up because they're playing 44 minutes, and they are just going at you time and time again. I don't, I don't know if Tatum and Brown are doing that night in and night out. I see it sometimes, and I love the way that Tatum played – in the last two games against the Cavs, like he, he went, no, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, game three, four, and five against the Cavs. He, I don't care that he went 10 for 25. 
I don't care if he had five turnovers. I don't care about any of that. He had that killer instinct look. Well, I think star players need to be like that every moment of the playoffs. And so far, we've seen a little bit of that, but not consistently. And, man, how about this? I, I'm going on Tatum right now. He had 36-12 and 12 in that game. That's how talented Jason Tatum is. And he had a moment, and 10 points in overtime. Like, he has that ability, but does he have the mentality to do it throughout the entire game? And that's the challenge. I think to win a championship, both those guys got to do that. And the rest of the guys will play off of them, and they'll be fine. But you got to have that seek and destroy mentality.